questions on salary and benefits. Um, as the state started well, running out of money, uh, there were uh, negotiations with uh, the employee uh, unions, and the, as I recall, they agreed to two years of no cost of living increases. Um, for FY18, is that still a year of no cost of living increases, or is that a year where the, the third year with a cost of living increase finally jumps in? It, um, through the Chair, Representative Garrett, depends on the, the contract uh, and which, which one is which. Several of them are in the zero cost of living increase. Um, the PSEA contract, which was just finalized, has does have an increase. Um, the corrections union, their last increase was this fiscal year. So the, large, yeah. the largest unions through the chair, that those are still in. Those are most most all of them are without cost of living increases, but I, we can get a whole a full list. Most of them for FY18 mm -hmm. still no cost of living mm -hmm. increase next year, but that's going to start. I mean, this is that's mm -hmm. the last year of it, right? Right. Okay. <coughs> through the chair. Yeah, yeah. through the chair. Um, just uh, lastly, um, don't mean to put you on the spot by this. I'm just so obviously somebody's got to take the lead on this issue of health care costs, and we'll have a hearing on that. And I know we saw the studies that came out from Mark Foster, and um, they were on narrow issues, uh, combining health care plans and things like that. Um, was OMB going to take the lead um, at some point on a sort of health care cost reduction effort? And, and <laughs> as I recall, OMB was going to. I know a lot of things happened this summer. Um, and so where are we on that? So through the chair, Representative Guerra, we, we are meeting internally um, with Department of Health and Social Services, Department of Administration, and, and Commerce and Economic Development. All three are working in, in separate areas, and OMB is taking kind of an umbrella view of how do we coordinate all of those efforts and, and be able to move, move in, in a very similar, at least make sure the right hand and the left hand know, know how we're moving and making sure that a, a particular initiative in one area doesn't counteract a, a desire to move in another area. So we are, we are actively uh, meeting t together to say how can we, as an entire organization, address health care costs. And we, um, within the budget, it's about one, one point, Initial um, analysis is about $1.2 billion goes through the state budget on the, on the state side for Medicaid, employee, health care costs, retiree on behalf payments, the amount of, of uh, benefits charged within our retirement contribution, how much of that goes to health care. Uh, how much health care is in corrections, how much health care is associated with juvenile justice, how much health care is associated with, you know, the recent um, federal waiver in our private insurance market. That's about $1.2 billion. If, if that continues to grow at f just at 5% versus a inflation-only forecast, in, in a few short years, that's a $200 million difference in our budget. So those are just initial um, overview cost pieces. Representative Guerra and then Ortiz. Yeah, thank you. Um, I only ask this because I'm going to, I'm probably going to have to miss a hearing or two this week to, mm -hmm. I'm going to run back to Anchorage for. A little closer to the mic. Uh, yeah, I, I only ask this question because I may miss the health care uh, presentation. I've got to run back to Anchorage for a very non-serious doctor's thing. But um, the, um, the, can we expect that the administration is going to have sort of an initiative that we'll see by the beginning of session? Or uh, that would be, it'd be sort of, we have two staff members mostly in most of our offices. I guess we could all do that. But if we're going to see something from the, the administration that relieves us of um, I that would be useful for me. Are mm -hmm. we going to see a, some sort of major initiative from the administration on health care cost containment um, come January? Through the chair, Representative Guerra, we will be continuing to focus on initiatives to the reduce cost. I, I'm, I'm not 
I'm not uh, prepared to say that it will be viewed as major, but we will continue to be working on costs. I think it is a big enough issue that um, there's going to be a lot of ideas out there. We all know it's the biggest uh, cost driver that we'll be facing, and but the solutions aren't simple, and any solution affects everybody. So we'll be moving. We will be continuing to focus on health care costs and what we can do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. And before we go to Representative Ortiz, I wanted to recognize that uh, Representative Christ Tompkins joined us, uh, Representative Quito, and I think I recognize uh, Representative Talrico, but if I didn't, he's been here from the beginning. So uh, thank you. Go ahead and proceed. Pat. Um, Going back up to the AMHS line, the Las Green Highway line, uh, the 44 million, that money was what you say was the total amount of drawdown from the Marine Highway Operating Fund. Is that the right term? The uh, through the chair, Representative Ortiz, I don't know the exact. It's the Marine Highway Fund, Alaska Marine Highway Fund. I'm not. I don't. I don't know the exact words for it, but it's. It's the Marine Highway Operating Fund. It's where the revenues from the the fares uh, is depo are deposited. And do you know after that 40, 44 million drawdown, how much there is in that fund at this point? Well, through the chair, Representative Ortiz, there is an issue that last at the end in the compromise for the budget for the operating budget last year. There was a deposit uh, intended to be 40 million in the fiscal year 17 budget. That deposit, because of the CBR cap and because of higher than expected other supplementals, that deposit is only turned out to only be um, it was supposed to be 30 million, and it turned out to only be 23 million. So that. If we don't replenish that 20, that intended 23 million, which we do intend to submit a supplemental for, if that's not replaced, then that that uh, fund would be completely exhausted uh, in in as early as April. And as a follow-up, could you give me a, a brief um, summary as to how that fund, when there was money in it, was used? Uh, for how it was used by the Marine Highway System in terms of going from year to year to year? Was it like a buffer fund, that kind of a thing? Uh, through the Chair Representative Ortiz, it was, it was used as, a, as, an, as an operating fund, but it only funded partial service. So uh, roughly you know, 35 to 40 percent of money for the highway, Marine Highway is through fares. The remaining part of the cost is general fund, um, so that, but it, both both fund sources were used to fund the operation of the of the marine highway system. By having the fund from the fares, there was a there was some certainty on cash flow, and there was to the extent a, a buffer in that if the legislature chose, they could appropriate additional money, you know, in a, in a year that was necessary. Um, under this, under this scenario, uh, there, there would not be that uh, operating flexibility. It's not so much flexibility because the legislature still has to appropriate the funds, but there's not the cash that exists. Representative Ortiz. Follow up. So, with that in mind, um, if you were to go back, like on your slide six, and put uh, transportation and then the marine highway system within transportation on that look back between 2015 to 2018, do you have an idea how much there was a reduction in transportation and then how much of a reduction as a part of that reduction in transportation was felt by the marine highway system? Does that make sense, my question? Through the chair, your question made perfect sense. It is not one I can answer off the top of my head, but it's significant. Transportation has a significant reduction. And would you say that the marine highway system 
also and a bigger uh, reduction, reduction as a part of that transportation mm -hmm. reduction. Both have had a significant reduction. Okay. Thank you. And before we go on further, Representative uh, Pruitt has joined us as well. Um, and I don't see any more questions. Pat, so go ahead. Okay. So in the Department of Corrections Inmate Health Care, we uh, requested, as part of the um, Medicaid reform effort, there was an expectation of lower inmate health care costs. In fact, Medicaid did pick up a significant amount of inmate health care costs, but we did not uh, receive as much reduction as we anticipated just due to the cost increases in health care. And um, so last year there was a, a supplemental request for $10 million if we If we managed in 18 to have that same amount, it'll be another $10 million uh, to cover health care costs because that was not part of the 18 base. And Representative Wilson had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So on this issue, uh, it's my understanding that um, there's been a, at least a couple, if not three, inmates that have um, gone to the lower 48 because of health costs and the, uh, the affordability of it um, going to the lower 48. In fact, one of them, my understanding, is up to half a million dollars of savings. So why is corrections not utilizing halfway houses electronic monitoring for some of our higher costs where we know Medicaid expansion will pick those up, but they won't pick them up if they're still in the institution. Mm -hmm. Through the chair, Representative Wilson, I think that there's been a case-by-case -case look at every, every option and they view it in, in respect with public safety as well as with cost. Call up, Mr. Chairman. Uh, follow up, Representative Wilson. Um, I, I believe, I can't remember if it was this session or last session we actually received information on what those illnesses were. And I, and I guess my point is, is that, you know, if you had to turn a halfway house into more of a medical type facility so that we would be able to utilize, and not just Medicaid expansion, their personal insurance would even pay, you know, if you had somebody who had private insurance, would also pick up, which it doesn't in the institution. Has that ever been looked at as an option? <coughs> Through the chair, Representative Wilson, I, I don't know for, for sure if we've looked at an inmate health care facility separate from a, a prison. And Mr. Chairman, my and point Rep is... Representative Wilson, and, 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 and I think we probably ought to get corrections in here to find out whether a halfway house is or is not. Um, it is. We, we, we received information on that, and in, in Medicaid expansion will on halfway houses, as well as electronic monitoring. But... Um, I, I guess it, you know, back to having the discussion on health, I would hope that could be, you know, added to that because that decision's only been a year. It's not been a long decision as far as Medicaid expansion goes. But I guess I just find it hard that if I have, you know, to have, you know, dialysis for kidney and I'm getting it paid for, I doubt seriously I'm probably going to run off and <coughs> not be able to get that treatment. So I think that has to be part of the health care. But as we're rewriting those contracts, now would be the time, I think, not just for mental health issues, but also into the, these kind of health issues, especially if our only other option is going to be sending some of our patients who are very ill out of state and away from families. Is there another avenue that we might be able to have and still have the savings? Thank you. And, and thank you for that. And we will be talking about health care and, and savings this, this week. And so we will add that to the agenda of things to talk about. Add it in there. Uh, Director Pitney, uh, did we have a question over here? No. Okay. Go ahead. So, so the next one uh, is actually just a difference between fund source.